So I will tell you a little bit about um, of the research that we do in my group, especially um, also, of course, uh, the research that we got the FAIR award for. Um, but I will um, give you a little bit more of context than this one uh, data set that we uh, handed in, especially because, um, as, as um, Sonia mentioned, I'm a binding chemist, but I, I really work at the border of inorganic biochemistry, microbiology, so that um, means we have very different type of research data that we generate. And that makes it really challenging because we don't really have like one shoe fits all for all the research data management that we have. So it's an ever evolving process, I would say. Okay, and I wanna, uh, in the beginning, I wanna thank uh, those two ladies, um, Violetta Weizauber and um, Rachel Janssen, my two PhD students who um, did the work um, that I'm presenting uh, in terms of the um, research data management today. So they really should de deserve this award. Okay, so just a quick introduction into lanthanides. Um, so the lanthanides are these elements are usually put at the bottom of the periodic table, which is a bit sad because they're actually in the middle of it. Um, when we talk about lanthanides, we mean the elements from lanthanum to lutetium. And when we talk about rare earth elements, we usually include scandium and yttrium as well. And these elements, even though they're part of the rare earth elements, are not rare at all. So you can find them everywhere in in nature around you. I bet you have like lots of them in your household. You have lots of them in your garden, in the soil, everywhere. And um, that the word rare is really misleading. You can see here in this graph. So this is the abundance of elements in the Earth's crust. And you can see that, for example, neodymium and cerium, the two of the most abundant ones, they're just as abundant as copper on zinc, for example. So these are two, you would say, not very rare elements. Here, by the way, this is like a picture of the Uterby mine in Sweden. I can recommend going there. It's a really cool place where lots of the lanthanides have been discovered and there's a lot of minerals off uh, with rare earths. Um, because we need these elements for so many different technological applications, the demand of these um, elements is steadily growing. So we are over 140,000 um, tons production of rare earth oxides per year. Because, for example, we use neodymium in hard drive magnets of our computers and our phones and so forth. Um, when we um, come to biology, um, it has been only recently known that these elements are not only essential for us humans for all our applications, but essential in terms of that some bacteria on this planet exist that need these elements to live. Um, previously, it was not thought at all that lanthanides or rare earth elements in general would be biologically relevant at all because um, they're usually forming poorly bioavailable phosphates so they're not very soluble in ecosystems. But in 2014, this really belief was turned over that lanthanides are biologically inert. In fact, there's lots of bacteria that use lanthanides. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, what our research has to do with it. So here's um, two types of bacteria and bear with me, this is little, there's a lot on this slide. Um, but in general, it can probably um, separate two types in nature of bacteria that can use lanthanides. There is one type of bacterium that you can find, for example, outside um, on a plant, like on a tree. Um, on the leaves, there's bacteria that use methanol from the, from the tree that it breathes out and uses it for the energy metabolism. And these bacteria can actually use lanthanides in the active site of an enzyme that turns over methanol to form formaldehyde. But these bacteria also have a calcium-dependent pathway to do the same reaction. So if there's no lanthanides around, they will just switch to that pathway. So these bacteria can use lanthanides, but don't have to. Then the second type of bacteria shown down here, um, they are absolutely dependent on lanthanides because for their energy metabolism, they need um, a lanthanide-dependent enzyme. So if you don't give them lanthanides, they were not able to live or grow these types of bacteria. And one of these bacteria, for example, has been isolated from, from a volcanic mud pot. And it seems like a very uh, extreme environment, but I can assure you that these bacteria that need lanthanides are everywhere. You can also find them in the soil in your garden, for example. So because it is quite intriguing, why would nature use these poorly insoluble <laughs> elements to catalyze important biological reactions? Um, my group is looking from a coordination chemist standpoint on all these um, aspects. First of all, we look at the enzymes themselves and the bacteria. Um, we're very interested how bacteria actually acquire lanthanides because they're so poorly soluble. And we've just identified the first lanthanophore and we're trying to get that published, um, which is really made by bacteria. It's a little natural product 
um, it sends it out and it binds lanthanides and it goes into the cell and then it can use it. There's also proteins that bind lanthanides and have very interesting applications, for example, for recycling of lanthanides and also separation of lanthanides. Two really important things. When you look at the use of rare earth elements, you need a lot of them. The mining of rare earth elements is terribly, <laughs> terribly, terrible for the environment, really. And the separation is really tedious and consumes lots of energy. So we need better methods for this. Okay, so um, when it comes to these two enzymes in nature that catalyze this important reaction, the oxidation of methanol to formaldehyde in these bacteria, you can see here the active sites. So the calcium enzyme has been known for over 50 years, and it's quite well known and studied. It has a redox factor called PQQ. Um, keep that in mind because that will become later, important later on. And um, we have a couple of amino acids that hold this um, calcium ion, the Lewis acid, in place. And then we have here our europium enzyme that we published a couple of years ago. Uh, there was the first europium enzyme so far, only the, the only europium enzyme that has been published. You can see it has quite a similar active site. But if you're a coordination chemist and work with lanthanides, you can also see how nature is really a very good coordination chemist because it has an extra amino acid here, which satisfies usually higher coordination number co requirements for lanthanides over calcium. So calcium and lanthanides are actually quite similar, but lanthanides have usually higher coordination numbers. So these are really two different enzymes. So I cannot put calcium in this enzyme, it will not work. And I can also not put uh, europium in the calcium enzyme, it will also not work. So these are really two different enzymes encoded by two different genes, although they're very similar, they're not the same. So my group is now interested in what does the, the lanthanide do? And like, what are the, maybe the differences between the lanthanides in, in this, um, in this system. And for this, for example, we um, we look at an APO enzyme. So we take out all the metals. So it express basically uh, APO enzyme without metal and without cofactor. Then um, my PhD student, Helena, she devised a protocol to soak um, our enzyme to be able to um, reconstitute it. And we can basically soak it with any metal ion and see whether this binds and will also give an active enzyme. We can then do an activity assay and see how well does this enzyme turn over methanol. So this is what we get. And I, we also included some actinides because actinides are very similar in their um, size and coordination chemistry um, to the lanthanides. So what you can see here, this is the activity of the enzyme in the presence of different metal ions. You can see calcium doesn't work at all. You can see the early lanthanides are working quite well and actually it rises up. That's probably due to the higher Lewis acidity as you go along the series because the lanthanides are getting smaller because of the lanthanide contraction, so become better Lewis acids, so help catalyze the reaction better. But then eventually the lanthanides become too small for the active site and the activity drops and maybe the lanthanides don't even bind anymore. But what is quite interesting is um, that these enzymes can also bind amorism and curium, and they have very similar ionic radii, the same oxidation state as the lanthanides, and they give very similar activities. So these enzymes that are devised by nature to work with lanthanides actually work with some actinides as well. They don't work with plutonium because plutonium, even if you start with plutonium 3 plus and it has a perfect um, ionic radius for this enzyme, it has such a rich oxidation chemistry, it will just oxidize and it will not uh, function anymore. So um, the lanthanide contraction here is, is obviously important. Um, we've also looked into um, whether not only the enzymes function with actinides, but also whether we can feed directly the bacteria, for example, with amylisium curium to be able to get them to grow on actinides without lanthanides. So to replace basically the essential lanthanides. And it turns out we can do that. So this was just published this, um, this year. If you're interested, you can have a look. And we've been also looking quite a lot into how to use bacteria di directly to recycle lanthanides and actinides and separate them from, from each other. So this is another study that came this year. But now I want to go a bit more into detail and also tell you about the, um, the research data management of one very specific aspect of this research. So I showed you that we look at the biochemistry of this enzyme with lanthanides. And if you look uh, more closely in the active site, you see this redox cofactor pyroloquinoline quinone. And since I'm a bioenergetic chemist, um, I also like coordination chemistry. So and for me, me, this is a really cool ligand. It's basically a pincer ligand from nature. So we are interested in looking at the coordination chemistry and see how this cofactor is activated by different metal ions. And we do this without this big enzyme warp around. 
So we want to look at just the, the cofactor and do so, so-called model complexes, or also maybe develop bio-inspired cat catalysts from this. There's one problem though. <laughs> um, when I first started, I looked how much PQQ would cost me uh, up at Aldridge and it was ridiculously expensive. Like with one milligram for 150 euros, you cannot really do much. And it turns out you can um, synthesize it. Um, and we did in the beginning. Um, this is like a 12 step synthesis to the trimethyl ester of PQQ. So you even have to saponify it after. Um, starting for, from this cheap precursor, but there's a lot of steps here. And um, I can tell you <laughs> um, this paper from 1981, and I'm not trying to shame the organic chemists. Obviously, E. Corey is amazing that he was able to synthesize this. Um, but this was all we had. This is two pages of a Jack's paper um, that describes this synthesis that we really, as inorganic chemists, had a hard time like figuring out because there was not much detail experimentally. Um, when we synthesized something, we were not sure if the NMR was the right thing because there was just like some hints for some products what the NMR would look like. So we had a problem. <laughs> and we thought, okay, we can maybe do that better. I'll get to that in, in a bit, um, how we try to do that better. Um, but I also, in the meantime, I looked at Amazon and it turns out you can buy a PQQ as a vitamin. That means it's food grade. It's very, very pure because it's actually made by bacteria, not by total synthesis, and they do it better, to be honest. Um, this costs roughly 30 euros on Amazon and you get roughly one gram of PQQ out of it. So way cheaper and way cleaner than the one I can buy from a chemical company. So we were really excited. We finally had this cofactors. So we can now do coordination chemistry, right? But then the following thing happened. We get um, precipitate. So it basically amorphous precipitate. In some cases, we got lucky, we get some crystal structures, but we can see there's like kind of coordination polymers, or there's forming dimers. So it's, it's not quite ideal because if I take this cofactor out of the active side of the enzyme, it then um, has the opportunity to really bind with the other carboxylic acids as well that would normally be blocked by the active uh, by the enzyme um, amino acids, for example. So we needed to go back to the cofactor or maybe modify it a bit before we could really look at mononuclear coordination complexes. So we did have to go back to the total synthesis. Um, we can, of course, we can look for um, the trimethyl ester, but we were interested maybe blocking the site out entirely, but for example, um, using a methyl group there and also maybe uh, put a ketone here instead of a carboxylic acid. So we went back to the synthesis and we um, published a paper of a synthesis that was based on the one on Cori, but obviously modular because we could like introduce different groups. And we were really careful to describe the synthesis so someone could actually reproduce it <laughs> without big problems. And here is where, um, this was, by the way, this were the, um, the comments from the reviewers, which we were really happy about. This is an organic journal, we were inorganic chemists, and we were very happy that we really uh, provided not only very much experimental um, details, but that um, especially we had put all the data in a fair way. And here is where this amazing <laughs> tool, Chemotion, comes into play. So we use in my group, um, the electronic lab journal, Chemotion. So we put in all our compounds. And then we also upload, for example, the raw FID files for the NMR and attach them to these compounds. And that is also linked to the publication. So now if someone synthesizes something and is not sure, did the synthesis work? They can go to, um, to this compound, open FID file in their Mestre Nova, overlay it with this substance, and then they will know, okay, this is the same compound that they also made. And we actually went st one step further recently, and we also sent some samples to the repository, um, to the sample database, so we were able to um, um, provide also samples for someone. So this is, I think, a really fair way to present this research data. And um, maybe to sum up and to come to conclusion, so, um, I believe I showed you like how for synthesis, it's very easy to, to make your data fair because you describe everything very well and you put all the raw data there. But the I think 
an aspect is also we have also biochemistry. We have lots of mass spec data. We have uh, UVVIS data. So thinking about how you can make this data fair and available, I think is an evolving process because platforms evolve. There's new platforms and new, new ways to describe or store data. So I think this is um, an ongoing process that we are continuously updating in our research data management plan about best practices, what works and what not. And so I come to a conclusion. Um, I'd like to thank my group. This is not the usual acknowledgement slide because um, I would put my collaborators there as well, but I want to highlight um, again, the two PhD students that worked on the synthesis uh, for PQQ derivatives and also did all the work in putting that into the repository in Camotion and of course um, the funding agencies. And I'm happy um, to have a little discussion with you now. Thank you.